Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Mexbra and Swinton Astronomical Society. One's in the in the flesh and the other's online. So this evening we have Neil Haggath, a speaker we've had on several occasions. Neil is the Programme Secretary of Cleveland and Darlington Astronomical Society and has been a member of CADAS for 41 years and on the committee for 33 years. He's been six times he was the Astromine champion and, uh, and then a regular question master, but five years ago the event was cancelled. That was obviously because uh, other people might have been winning. I know we've had uh, members of our society who won. So then he's... Um, it's because they couldn't travel. get contestants anymore. Well, that's the part of the problem, isn't no, it? Nobody was interested anymore. No. So um, he's a veteran of six total eclipse expeditions, four which were successful, and the author of a winning website, 3W's Space and Sanity.com. So please, everybody, put your hands together and welcome Neil Haggath. Thank you. Over to you, Neil. Thanks, Steve. Share my screen. Right, hope you can see me PowerPoint. You can. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, what, what I'm actually doing tonight is two Neils for the price of one, though that's not really a relevant expression since the price is zero, <laughs> as I'm not travelling, obviously. But I'm doing two talks. This this is the main talk I'm doing, the most amazing fact, but it, it's not very long. It's only about 35 minutes. So as a bonus, I'm following it with another short one that's only about 15 minutes called Astronomy Goes Bananas, which some of you have heard before quite a few years ago. But for those who haven't, what it means will, will be revealed. So first one, the most amazing fact. A few years ago, the American astronomer and science popularizer, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the nearest thing we now have to a worthy successor to the late great Carl Sagan, was asked what he thought was the most astounding fact revealed to us by science and made a video with his answer. His choice of most astounding fact is one with which I wholeheartedly agree. And for that matter, I'm pretty sure Carl himself would have said the same. So, so this is my own attempt to convey what I truly believe is the most amazing fact which science has revealed to us. But I have to tell a bit of a story to lead up to it. It's all about the birth, life, and especially the death of stars. Firstly, we need to consider a couple of terms which are familiar to anyone with a knowledge of all level chemistry. An endothermic reaction is one that requires a steady input of energy to keep it going. An exothermic reaction is one which, once it's begun, releases energy. Fire is an example of an exothermic reaction. It takes a certain input of energy in the form of heat to start something burning. But once it starts, it releases a far greater amount of energy. Of course, energy can't be created or destroyed. It's more accurate to say that, that an exothermic reaction converts chemical binding energy into heat, while an endothermic one does the opposite. While these terms are most commonly used in chemistry, they also very much apply in nuclear physics. And that's what's vitally important to this story. Somebody just give me a thumbs up to confirm that you can hear me clearly. Yeah, good. <laughs> the birth of stars could itself take up an entire talk of this length, but I'll cover it briefly. Stars are formed by the gravitational collapse of gas clouds into stellar space. The matter in these clouds is incredibly tenuous, just a few atoms per cubic centimetre. But in a region many light years across, it adds up to a lot. Various effects cause some of this matter to clump or collect into regions of slightly higher than average density. Very slowly at first, the mutual gravitational attraction of the matter in a denser than average region draws the matter towards the region's centre. It begins to condense and increase further in density. 
Gradually, over many millions of years, a cloud of gas and dust accumulates several light years across, which is significantly denser than the surrounding interstellar medium. Naturally, the denser the cloud becomes, the more quickly it condenses. Typically, the cloud contains a few thousand solar masses of matter, but gravitational instabilities eventually cause it to fragment into many smaller clumps, each a fraction of a light year across and containing just a few solar masses. It's these smaller clumps which will eventually condense into stars. Stars are invariably born in clusters, with dozens or hundreds of stars packed into a relatively small volume of space. And by small, I mean a few light years across. <clears throat> As a cloud of gas and dust collapses inwards under its own gravity, increasing in density, its temperature also increases. A bit of basic physics here. As a given particle of matter falls towards the cloud's center of gravity, it loses gravitational potential energy and gains kinetic energy. Temperature is simply a measure of the kinetic energy of atoms or molecules. When it reaches a temperature at which it begins to emit a significant level of infrared radiation, we call the object a protostar. So the protostar becomes steadily smaller, denser and hotter until something happens that prevents it collapsing any further. That something occurs when the core of the collapsing protostar reaches a temperature of about 10 million degrees. That's the temperature required to enable the thermonuclear fusion of hydrogen to helium. Hydrogen fusion is an exothermic reaction. Though it requires a huge amount of energy to trigger it, it releases an even greater amount. Consider a hydrogen bomb, which requires an ordinary uranium nuclear bomb to trigger it. Once fusion has begun, the matter in the protostar is heated to a greater degree than it could have been by gravitational collapse alone and acquires enough kinetic energy to counteract gravity and resist any further collapse. So from then on, the protostar becomes a stable sphere of constant size. As long as fusion continues in the core, there'll be a continuous supply of energy to maintain the equilibrium. The thermonuclear ignition of its core is the point at which a protostar becomes a true star. And the delicate balance between gravity and outward energy flow is what governs the remainder of its life, or most of it. It enters a stable state in which it will remain for about 90% of its lifetime. In astrophysics, we say it enters the main sequence of the Hirschsprung-Russell diagram, a graph that relates various properties of stars, but that's a topic beyond the scope of this talk. At this point, we can't yet see the new star, as it's embedded within an obscuring cloud of debris left over from, on the original cloud from which it was born. This surrounding gas and dust is heated by the star and begins to glow, forming an emission nebula. Some of these nebulae are, are among the amateur astronomers' favourite deep sky objects, such as the magnificent Orion Nebula. They are stellar nurseries with entire clusters of very young stars hidden within them. And in M42, of course, there's the trapezium. After a few million years, the stellar wind from the young stars disperses the nebula and they become visible as an open cluster or galactic cluster, such as the Pleiades, where, of course, we still see the last remaining bits of the nebula heated by the stars. While stars are always born in clusters, they don't stay together forever. Over many millions of years, the random motions of the stars in a cluster eventually cause them to drift apart and the cluster disperses. How long a star spends on the main sequence is heavily dependent on its mass. The smaller the star, the longer its life. That might not seem to make sense at first. Don't smaller stars run out of fuel sooner? No, because bigger stars need to generate energy at a far higher rate to balance their gravity. A star with 10 times the sun's mass needs to burn its fuel at a thousand times the sun's rate. Therefore, it'll exhaust its fuel in a hundredth of the time. The biggest and hottest stars live for only a few tens or at most hundreds of millions of years. Sun-like stars live for about 10 billion years. The sun itself is currently about halfway through its main sequence lifetime. And the smallest and coolest red dwarfs live for much longer still. Many are still around now, which were among the first stars to be formed in the early universe. Now, how exactly does a star generate its energy during its life on the main sequence? 
It's initially made mostly of hydrogen, which it fuses into helium in the same reaction that powers hydrogen bombs. The process is known as the proton-proton cycle. For those interested in the details, it works as follows. Two hydrogen nuclei, which are just protons, fuse together to form a nucleus of deuterium or heavy hydrogen, which contains a proton and a neutron. One of the protons actually turns into a neutron by emitting a positron or anti-electron and a massless neutrino. The deuterium then captures another proton to become a nucleus of helium-3, which is two protons and one neutron. Finally, two helium-3 nuclei combine to form a single nucleus of helium-4 with two protons and two neutrons, with the two excess protons being released. Then those protons in turn fuse with others and we get a chain reaction. The net result is that four hydrogen nuclei are combined into one helium-4 nucleus, but the mass of the end product is very slightly less than that of the initial protons, even accounting for the positrons. So where has that missing bit of mass gone? It's been converted into energy in accordance with Einstein's principle, principle of equivalence, E equals mc squared. In a star's core, hydrogen nuclei are being fused in immense numbers. That's where the constant supply of energy comes from that holds the star up against gravitational collapse and causes it to emit huge amounts of light and other radiation. The sun is in fact losing mass at the rate of 4 million tonnes a second. But don't worry, it still has enough fuel to sustain it for a long time yet, another 5 billion years. Now let's look at what happens in a star's old age as it begins to exhaust its supply of hydrogen fuel. You might think it would just simply keep on shining till the last of its hydrogen is used up and then finally fizzle out, succumb to gravity and squash itself into some kind of dead, st dead state. But that's not quite the case. In fact, a star's death throes begin long before it actually runs out of hydrogen. Fusion reactions only occur in the star's central core. Its outer regions aren't hot enough. Remember that the temperature at its centre is measured in millions of degrees, but that of its surface is a mere few thousand. The helium produced by fusion is denser than hydrogen, so it naturally sinks towards the star's centre. So the very centre of the core becomes a dead sphere of pure helium, with the hydrogen fusion taking place in a shell a bit further out. This helium core produces no energy of its own, though initially it's hot enough to resist gravitational collapse. Slowly but surely, the helium core grows ever bigger as more helium produced in the hydrogen burning, cell, burning shell falls into it. Eventually, it reaches a certain critical mass at which it can no longer support its own weight. And then the star's doomed. The helium core begins to collapse under gravity while the outer layers swell up and are thrown off into space. When a star has recently undergone this process, we see it as what we call a planetary nebula, a very silly name due to what they look like in early telescopes. They're actually not really nebulae and have nothing to do with planets, such as the famous ring nebula. Then something happens that halts the collapse of the core. The collapse heats it to even higher temperatures. Eventually, it reaches a temperature at which helium can itself begin fusion reactions to form heavier elements. And this is the first vital fact that leads, to more, that leads towards my most amazing fact. It's believed that the only elements initially produced in the Big Bang were hydrogen and helium, and that all other elements that now exist have been produced in the cores of stars. At this point, the star enters the next stage of its evolution. This new phase of helium burning causes its outer layers to swell to an enormous size. Its radius increases about a hundredfold, while its surface cools and reddens. It leaves the stable state in which it's resided happily for the last 10 billion years, and within a very short time, a mere couple of million years, becomes a red giant. This, of course, spells disaster for any planet's orbit in the star. When the sun becomes a red giant five billion years from now, its surface will be somewhere near the orbit of the Earth. The three inner planets will be completely destroyed. 
The red giant phase is relatively short-lived. It lasts just a few tens of millions of years. Of course, it now has a new core composed of the denser products of the helium burning and surrounded by concentric shells of helium and hydrogen burning. When this core reaches a critical mass, the star finally loses the long battle against gravity. The core collapses, the tenuous outer layers are thrown off, and what remains of the star with nothing left to support it shrinks inexorably to become a white dwarf. The white dwarf is a very strange object. With no energy source to resist gravity, it collapses into an extremely compact and dense state with the mass of the sun compressed into a sphere about the size of the earth. It's now composed of a, of a bizarre kind of matter that's found nowhere else in the universe with a staggering density of around a million tons per cubic meter, a piece the size of a sugar lump would weigh a ton. At such a density, the familiar laws of classical physics break down. The behavior of white dwarf matter is governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. The more massive a white dwarf, the smaller its radius, which again doesn't appear to make sense. This is because the forces between atoms try to resist further compression, but the stronger the object's gravity, the more easily these forces can be overcome and the closer the atoms can be squashed. But there is still a limit to how far a white dwarf, a white dwarf can be compressed. There's an effect of quantum physics called electron degeneracy pressure, which halts the collapse and causes the white dwarf to stabilize at a particular size. The electrons in each atom can only exist in certain discrete energy levels, and no two can occupy the same energy level. That's like trying to put two pegs in the same hole. In a white dwarf, all electrons are forced into the lowest energy levels. After that, no amount of further compression can force the atoms closer together. This effect resists gravity and prevents the star being squashed any smaller. Of course, the compression of matter to this dense state has made it very hot. The surface temperature of a white dwarf is around 10,000 degrees C. That's why it grows white. But after the collapse has been halted by electron degeneracy pressure, there's no longer any source of heating. So the star gradually begins to cool again. Very slowly over billions of years, it becomes steadily cooler and dimmer, fading from white to red till eventually it ceases to shine at all and ends its days as a black dwarf, cold, dark and thoroughly dead. <coughs> Going back a minute or two, we have the second vital fact. When the star's core collapses and its outer layers are thrown off, those heavier elements that were produced in its core are dispersed into the interstellar medium and mixed into the gas clouds from which a new generation of stars will eventually form. The first generation of stars, some of which still exist to this day, those long-lived small red ones, consisted only of hydrogen and helium. Those of the second and later generations, including our sun, also contain heavier elements. Everything other than hydrogen and helium was produced in the cores of earlier long dead stars. The theory that all elements other than hydrogen and helium are produced in the cores of stars was first proposed in a famous paper in 1957 called Synthesis of the Elements in Stars by Margaret and Geoffrey Burbage, William Fowler and Fred Hoyle. In later years, the paper was cited so often that it came to be referred to simply as B squared FH for the author's names. And one of those authors, Margaret Burbage, lived to see everything well and truly confirmed. She lived to the age of 100 and died only two years ago. What I've described so far is the death of an ordinary star like the sun. Apart from a brief blaze of glory in its red giant phase, it's fair to say that it finally goes out, not with a bang, but a whimper. But the same isn't true of much bigger stars. There is, in fact, a limit to the size of, of a white dwarf. If the mass of the star, or rather what's left of it after it's blown off its outer layers during the red giant phase, is greater than 1.4 solar masses, then its gravity is so powerful that it overcomes even electron degeneracy pressure and it's compressed to an even denser state. That limiting mass is called the Chandrasekhar limit after its discoverer. When a star whose mass exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit collapses, the end result is something even weirder than a white dwarf. 
It's another remarkable fact that normal matter, even solid matter, consists mainly of empty space. The nucleus of an atom is an incredibly small and dense object whose diameter is a tiny fraction of that of the whole atom with its orbiting electrons. But how tiny might surprise you. We're all familiar with the, the traditional simplified diagram of an atom like that with the nucleus in the middle and the or electrons orbiting round. But if that was drawn properly to scale, then the nucleus would be a microscopic dot. Imagine an atom of a heavy element such as uranium to be the size of a football stadium with the outermost electrons orbiting around the back of the stance. Then how big do you think the nucleus would be on that same scale? Size of the centre circle, maybe? No, it would be the size of a P on the centre spot. But when a big star's gravity overcomes electron degeneracy, the electrons in each atom are forced into the nucleus where they're combined with protons to turn them into neutrons. Separate atomic nuclei, now consisting entirely of neutrons, are forced vastly closer together than is possible in normal matter, resulting in an object many orders of magnitude denser even than a white dwarf. This bizarre object is called, not surprisingly, a neutron star since it consists mainly of a mass of neutrons and not much else. Its density, now comparable to that of a gigantic atomic nucleus, is truly staggering. For a star whose mass just exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit, the resultant neutron star has a radius of only about 10 kilometers. A cubic centimeter of it weighs 100 million tons. So what finally halts the collapse of a neutron star? Well, neutrons also exhibit a kind of quantum behaviour that prevents them being forced too close together. As a white dwarf is held up by electron degeneracy pressure, so a neutron star is held up by neutron degeneracy pressure. The existence of neutron stars was predicted in the 1930s, three decades before the first ones were actually discovered. In, in fact, only a couple of years after the discovery of the neutron itself, it was actually Fritz Zwicky who first predicted that they had them, the, the original grumpy old git. The physics of neutron stars is truly bizarre, but, but is well beyond the scope of this talk, and beyond me for that matter. A star whose mass is a few times greater than that of the sun suffers similar death throes to that of a sunlight star, except that its end product is a neutron star instead of a white dwarf. But the biggest and hottest stars, the blue supergiants, with masses of about eight or more solar masses, end their lives in much more dramatic fashion. They go out not with a whimper, but with a very big bang indeed. In fact, you could say they commit a spectacular suicide. The demise of such a star is marked by one of the most violent events in the universe, a supernova. More accurately, the event I'm about to describe is called the Type 2 supernova. A Type 1 is a completely different kind of stellar explosion, which is equally dramatic, but unrelated to the death of, of a blue supergiant. The term supernova is actually pretty daft and misleading, but unfortunately we stuck with it. Firstly, as I've just said, we use the same word to describe two totally different and unrelated phenomena. Secondly, the word is derived from nova, which is itself short for nova stella or new star. A classical nova is a stellar eruption on a much smaller scale, which causes a star's brightness to increase greatly for a time. It's so-called because it sometimes results in a normally faint star temporarily becoming visible to the naked eye, giving the appearance of a new star having suddenly appeared in the sky. The word supernova, as you can imagine, was invented to mean an especially bright nova but we now know that novae and supernovae are totally different and unrelated phenomena. Such, such adjectives as spectacular and dramatic are really not adequate to describe a supernova. When a massive star explodes in this manner, its brightness suddenly increases by a factor of a billion or more. For a very brief time, usually just a few star, just a few days, the star can outshine the rest of the entire galaxy in which it's situated. 
In fact, almost all our knowledge of supernovae comes from observing them in galaxies other than our own. They're so bright they can be detected at distances of hundreds of millions of light years. <clears throat> and of course, they get they're frequently bright enough to be seen by amateur astronomers. A few years ago, there was one in M82 that was uh, that was easily visible in modest amateur telescopes. Even I managed to see it, so it must have been easy. <clears throat> Supernovae are very rare events. Within any given galaxy, they, they occur at an average rate of just once every one every couple of centuries. By sheer bad luck, none have occurred in our own galaxy since the invention of the telescope. And there actually was one just four years before the invention of the telescope, but we haven't had one since. Luckily, in 1987, astronomers were blessed with the next best thing. Supernova 1987A exploded in the Large Magellanic Cloud, one of the small satellites of our galaxy. Apart from that one, we've only been able to study them in distant galaxies many millions of light years away. So what causes a supernova? Well, it's an inevitable consequence of nuclear physics. I explained earlier how a star generates its energy during the main part of its life by the nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium and how the fusion of helium into heavier elements causes a sunlight star to swell into a red giant, the beginning of its death throes. <coughs> but in more massive stars, things don't stop there. All those heavier elements that are being produced also sink into the star's core. The greater the star's mass, the higher the temperature that's produced in its core by this infalling of denser elements. And the higher the temperature, the further the process of nuclear fusion can go. The carbon and oxygen sink into the centre, where they are heated to even greater temperatures, then they fuse into neon and next to silicon. So now the star's core consists of a series of concentric spherical shells, each sustaining a particular fusion reaction. The outermost shell still consists of hydrogen. Inside that is a denser and hotter shell of helium, then further shells of carbon, oxygen, neon, and finally silicon in the centre. Other elements are also produced, but those are the ones that dominate in each of the shells. Remember that such a big star is short-lived. It's had, as it's had to consume its hydrogen fuel at an extravagant rate to counteract its huge gravity. It's taken only a few tens of millions of years to reach this state. Finally, if the star's mass is eight or more solar masses, its, cent its center reaches a temperature over a billion degrees at which silicon nuclei can fuse to form iron. And when that happens, it spells disaster for the star. A work colleague, an intelligent and educated guy, once asked me in puzzlement, how is it that the fusion of light elements into heavy ones, as in stars and hydrogen bombs, releases energy, while the fission of heavier elements into lighter ones, as in nuclear reactors and ordinary nuclear bombs, also releases energy. He couldn't see how that's possible. Surely if going one way releases energy, going the other must absorb it. Well, the answer is that both release energy only so far. The most stable atomic nucleus is that of iron, iron, iron 56 to be exact. The fusion of light elements into heavy ones is exothermic until iron is produced, but going beyond iron becomes endothermic. Similarly, the fission of heavier elements into la lighter ones is also exothermic till it gets down to iron and splitting that any further becomes endothermic. So up to now, all of the fusion reactions have been exothermic and have therefore continued to provide a supply of energy to hold the star up against gravity. But once iron's produced, going any further suddenly becomes endothermic. The energy required to trigger the reaction is greater than the amount released. This energy is, is provided by that immense heating of the star's core. This is the only process in the universe that can produce nuclei heavier than iron. Every existing atom of every element heavier than iron, the gold or silver in your jewellery, the copper or lead in your water pipes, the mercury in your tooth fillings, the uranium used in nuclear reactors, etc., etc., was produced in the core of a supergiant star in the final moments of its life. 
and that's my next vital fact. This abrupt transition from exothermic to endothermic reactions has fatal and dramatic consequences. It means that almost instantaneously, the star loses its energy source and loses the battle against gravity. While a supernova is commonly described as a stellar explosion, it actually begins with an implosion. The star's, the star's core suddenly collapses inwards within about a second heating itself in the process to a staggering temperature of about 50 billion degrees. Note that this sudden collapse only occurs in the star's core. Astronomer Phil Plate coined a wonderful description of what happens next. He said that the star's outer layers then experience a wily coyote moment, as in the joke where he runs, runs off the edge of a cliff, suddenly realises he's hanging in midair, and then begins to fall. For some reason, it always plays that twice, and I can't figure out why. Sorry. Momentarily, the outer layers really are suspended above nothing. Then they, in turn, fall inwards under gravity towards the core, becoming heated to immense temperatures. Then, due to this intense heating, the infalling material bounces outwards again, and the star blows itself apart in a colossal explosion. For a few days, it shines more brilliantly than an entire galaxy. Then it gradually fades over a period of months or years. So again, all those heavy elements produced by the core's collapse are dispersed into the interstellar medium to become the material from which later stars and their planets will be born. And that's my final vital fact. What remains of the star's core now collapses under gravity to become a neutron star. Meanwhile, the material that was blown off from its outer layers continues to expand at a rate of thousands of kilometers per second. This expanding shell of incandescent gas can be seen from thousands of light years away and, re and remains visible to astronomers for thousands of years as it gradually cools and fades. There are many examples in our own galaxy of these supernova remnants glowing gas clouds with neutron stars, some of which we detect as pulsars in the centres. Some of these are remains of stars that exploded many millennia ago. During recorded human history in the pre-telescopic era, we know of eight supernovae that occurred in our galaxy between AD 185 and 1604. More accurately, the, the historians of various cultures recorded the appearance of very bright new stars in the sky, and their descriptions are consistent with supernovae. For some of these, where the position of the phenomenon was recorded with sufficient accuracy, astronomers have been able to identify the corresponding remnant. The best known example is the supernova that was seen in AD 1054. It was recorded by Chinese astronomers who called it a guest star and left very detailed descriptions of its position, its brightness and the time over which it remained visible. At its peak, it was so bright as to be visible in daylight. The remnant of this event is the famous Crab Nebula in Taurus. About six and a half thousand light years away. Of course, AD 1054 was the year in which the light from it reached the Earth. The explosion actually occurred six and a half thousand years earlier. The glowing shell of gas is now about 14 light years across. It shines partly because it's still hot and partly because it's excited by radiation from the neutron star at its heart. The latter was one of the first known pulsars and is by far the most studied. <coughs> the Crab Nebula is regarded by astrophysicists as one of the most important objects in the sky. As well as being one of the closest supernova remnants, it's also one of the very few for which we know precisely when the explosion occurred. Studying the structure of the remnant and knowing exactly how old it is can tell us a lot about how it's evolved. It's been said with only a little exaggeration that modern astrophysics can be divided into two parts, the Crab Nebula and everything else. 
I said earlier that what remains of the star's core after the explosion collapses to form a neutron star. That's usually the case, but not always. The mass of this remaining core is only a fraction of the giant star's initial mass, but it can still be equal to several suns. If its mass is greater than about three solar masses, then its immense gravity will overcome even neutron degeneracy pressure. And then there's absolutely nothing left to, to halt its collapse. In this case, the end product is one of the most bizarre objects in the universe, a black hole. A black hole represents the ultimate state of gravitational collapse, an object that's literally crushed itself out of existence. In theory, it shrinks to what we call a singularity, a point mass of zero dimensions and infinite density. It's like a bottomless pit of gravity from which nothing, not even light, can escape. The physics of black holes is well beyond the scope of this talk and well beyond me. So finally, we put all this together. Our sun and its planets, with all the heavy elements that make up the rocky planets such as the Earth, formed from the cloud of debris left by an ancient supernova, the violent death of an earlier massive star. And apart from the hydrogen, every atom that makes up you and me was created in the core of some long dead star. That, in my and Neil Tyson's opinion, is the most amazing fact revealed to us by science. In the immortal words of Carl, we are star stuff. Thank you. Neil, thank you very much, sir. Now, we could have a quick question and answer session. Yeah. Before, uh, let your voice rest for a moment. Yeah. And, uh, and then we'll continue. Yeah. So, if you just stop second, sharing. Second talk is only about 15 minutes. That's okay. We'll just five minutes worth of um, questions. Yeah. And uh, so, Neil, uh, so Neil, uh, one of the things that occurs to me from your talk is I've never really thought what's happening in the nucleus of an atom, but within the nucleus itself, there must be some space between the neutrons and the protons. Um. I haven't a clue, is the honest answer. Right, okay. It was just, it was just about observation rather than the question. Yeah. So, yeah. Of course, protons for... and neutrons are themselves made up of smaller particles. Well, they are. They are. <laughs> we're into exotic material now that have got more than three uh, quarks in them, aren't we? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, all, and that's way beyond my, my yeah. knowledge. <laughs> But most, of, most of what I learned about nuclear physics at uni, I've long forgotten. Yeah. And, and I think Julian Onions is your man to, to talk about that sort of thing. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think these, this new exotic material lasts for, if I can remember it right, 100,000, sorry, 100,000 billion billionth of a second. <laughs> It's not really worth making, is it? Uh, all that energy, but uh, there you go. So we're looking for questions, electronic hands, please. If uh, not, wave at me. Have we got a question in the room? No question in the room. No question from anybody at all. Well, you've obviously flabbergasted everybody. <laughs> Well, give give me a minute to get my next PowerPoint. I'll confess. Oh, <sighs> John Leach is waving at me. So before we start you off on your second go, John, unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Good evening, John. Good evening, uh, good evening, everyone. Neil, uh, amazing talk. I mean, the thing is, it, it's so advanced. It's so, you know, you've got to be really geared up in in, in this area to to fully understand it. And I think all you've got to do is. Uh, you listen to something like this, what Neil was given tonight, and you just go away thinking, wow, this is amazing. And you don't, you don't need to fully understand it. Um, you just appreciate that's, that's what it I is. I think I do. <laughs> well, you, you, you have a special, a special sort of need, don't you? <laughs> it's your pastime. 
Okay, John. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't say I fully understand it. <laughs> but you don't need to when you're there. That's the thing. Well, when it when it comes when it comes to quantum mechanics, I mean, nobody does. You know, mm. the great physicist Gerald Feynman said, "If you think you understand quantum mechanics, then you don't understand quantum mechanics." Yeah. Yeah. Because nobody really does. They can, they can work out the theory. They can, they can write equations that describe mathematically what's going on. But nobody can really visualize because no. it's so totally alien to, to the normal world that we, we perceive around us. Nobody can really visualize what it means for something to be both a particle and a wave and such things, can they? It's, mm. It, it can all be modelled mathematically, but nobody can really understand it. Mm. Yep, that total. Okay, John. Okay. I, think my, I think my only uh, before you start, then you know, I think my only other comment would be: I wish Carl Sagan had paid more attention in English class, because being made of the stuff of stars is much easier on the ear than stuff you're made of star stuff. <laughs> so. Uh, Anyway, onwards and upwards. So, if you want to right. uh, share your screen okay. again, Neil, and we'll do part two. Okay, so after that heavy stuff, a bit of light relief for the next 15 minutes or so. And I know some of you have seen this before, and hopefully you won't mind seeing it again, but as for what the weird title means, all will soon be revealed. And don't worry, it's certainly nothing to do with him. Those of you who follow spaceflight will be aware of an annoying trend that's pervaded NASA in recent years, the proliferation of contrived acronyms. Spacecraft are no longer given simple names like Voyager. Instead, every name has to be an acronym, standing for some awful long-winded description. Probably the worst example is messenger the probe that, huh, that was sent to mercury just the word messenger would have been a perfectly apt and sensible name for a probe to mercury as in the messenger of the gods but no nasa decided it had, it had to stand for something and they made up the long title to fit the acronym it stands for wait for this mercury space and surface environment geochemistry and ranging York. And of course, they're not doing themselves any favours, are they? Romantic names like Mariner and Viking and Voyager captured the public imagination. Daft acronyms don't. But NASA doesn't have the monopoly, doesn't have the monopoly on awful acronyms. Astronomy also has more than its fair share. Modern astronomy, as we all know, abounds with jargon. Researchers are forever inventing long-winded technical names for exotic objects and phenomena, not to mention for their projects and instruments. Usually they like to shorten these names to neat acronyms or abbreviations. There are literally hundreds of them. Some are witty, some corny, and some just daft. But they show that astronomers have a sense of humour all of their own. I'm going to show you some of the best or worst ones depending on your point of view. I'll start with probably the best known example. One of the biggest debates in, in present day astronomy, or at least a few years ago, maybe not so much anymore, concerns the nature of dark matter. We know, we know that a significant proportion of the mass of the universe consists of matter in some form that's invisible to us, but nobody knows yet what it is. There were two competing theories, though I think one of them's pretty much fallen out of fashion now. One says that it consists of enormous numbers of some exotic some, some exotic subatomic particles which fill the whole of space, while the other says it consists of conventional matter in the form of objects in the disks or halos of galaxies, which it's simply too faint to detect, such as huge numbers of brown dwarfs or even mini black holes. But the second has fallen out of fashion. Most people are now convinced that it's the huge numbers of, of particles. But the, the proponents of the first theory, who don't claim to know exactly what the mysterious particles are, refer to them by the generic name of weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs. Those who supported the rival theory 
responded by calling their hypothetical objects massive compact halo objects or machos. There are numerous examples where, as with Messenger, it's pretty obvious that somebody's thought of a nice appropriate word to use as an acronym and then invented a long title to fit it. Some of these are pretty awful. Most of us are familiar with that wonderful Hubble Space Telescope image of the pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula. In it, we see dense clumps of gas whose outer layers are evaporating away and inside which new stars are being born. These have been named evaporating gaseous globules or eggs. Another class of objects, luminous gas clouds that are being ejected at high speeds from planetary nebulae are known as fast low ionization emitting regions or flyers. The Hubble itself gave rise, rise to a rather nice acronym. The package of corrective optics, which was installed by shuttle astronauts to compensate for the defective mirror and without which, and without which the telescope could never have operated properly, is aptly named Corrective Optics Space Telescope Axial Replacement or CoStar. When it comes to the naming of instruments and projects, there are countless examples of horribly contrived names being invented to fit the desired acronyms. A nice example is System for High Angular Resolution Pictures or SHARP. Another in similar vein is Precision Optical Interferometer in Space or POINTS. But this one's quite the opposite. Systematic multi wavelength unbiased catalogue of dwarf galaxies and evolution of structure smudges. <laughs> and now, my favourite one in the outback of Australia, there's an array of gamma ray detectors jointly funded by Australia and Japan, which, re which rejoices in the, in the name of you love this one. Collaboration of Australia and Nippon for a gamma ray observatory in the outback. Kangaroo. And if you, and if you think that's terrible, there's worse to come. <clears throat> Those inscrutable chaps from the east also have a nice one of their own. The Transient Observatory for Microlensing and Bursting Objects is an array of detectors with a very wide field of view that resembles the compound eye of an insect. And Tombo happens to be the Japanese for dragonfly. One of the projects that's currently searching for intelligent radio signals is called Project Serendip. You might think that's quite a lovely name till you see what it stands for and prepare to cringe. Search for extraterrestrial radio emissions from nearby developed intelligent populations. How contrived is that? There are some acronyms that bear no relation to the long name or the instrument's purpose, but are quite clever because they form astronomical words. How about these? Arizona Infrared Imager and Eschel Spectrograph, or ARIES. Deep Extragalactic Imaging Multi-Object Spectrograph, or DEMOS. Probing Lensing Anomalies Network, or PLANET. And at the Royal Observatory Edinburgh, they have a marvellous instrument for automatically measuring Schmidt plates. And you love this, it measures coordinates, sizes, magnitudes, orientations and shapes cosmos. There are lots of astronomical surveys that observe or measure something over the entire sky, but how about this for a name? Coordinated Molecular Probe Line Extinction Thermal Emission Survey or the Complete Survey. The next few acronyms have no connection or relevance to their expanded meanings, but are nevertheless quite amusing. 
Whoever named this instrument is obviously a fan of old movies. Chicago Air Shower Array, Broad Lateral non image Cherenkov Array, or Casablanca. This one must have been designed by husband and wife team. High intensity spectrograph, high energy range spectrometer, his, hers. This one must have been named by an opera fan. French Italian Gamma Ray Observatory or Figaro, but wasn't he Spanish? And whoever named this one must be fond of Moggies. Minimum Inertia Adaptive Optics Widget or Meow. Now how contrived is that using a nonsense word like widget to make your acronym work? Astronomers are often quite passionate about their work and many seem to regard the telescopes and instruments as the loves of their lives. Maybe this explains why a remarkable number of instruments and projects, both existing and proposed, have been christened with girls' names. Examples include Amanda for Antarctic Muon and Neutrino Detector Array, Amber, Astronomical Multi-Beam Recombiner, DAISY, Data Acquisition and Interpretation System. FIFI, Far Infrared Fabri Perro Interferometer. CARMEN, for Karlsruhe Appleton Rutherford Medium Neutrino Experiment. That's another one to, that's especially contrived as they reverse the name of the Rutherford Appleton lab to make it fit. LISA, laser interferometer space antenna. Monica, Montreal infrared camera. Susie, Sonja F. Zeldovich infrared experiment. And Steffi, Spectrograph Telescope Fiber Feed Interface. But this one must have been named by a lady astronomer getting her own back, Adonis for Adaptive Optics Near Infrared System. There are even some corny acronyms that were specifically invented to take the mick out of arrival. One observatory built an instrument called the Submillimeter Common User Bolometric Array or SCUBA. And together with it goes the SCUBA User Reduction Facility or SURF. Then a rival team claiming that their similar instrument was better called it Submillimeter High Angular Resolution Camera or SHARK because they claimed it would eat SCUBA alive. But I've saved the worst till last. In Japan, there's an underground neutrino detector that's been operating for many years called Super Kamiokande. Now that's, that's under a mountain called Mount Kamioka. So the name is really Kamioka NDE, meaning Nucleon Decay Experiment. And they added the super after a major upgrade. But another group in the States built a similar detector, which they claimed would do the job far better and called it just wait for this one. Gadolinium antineutrino detectors zealously outperforming old Kamiya Candy's super. Gadzooks. And the principal investigator insists on it being written with the exclamation mark. And finally, there's one example where we can be thankful that somebody didn't use an acronym. You'll think I'm making this up, but I swear I'm not. Somebody actually published a paper entitled The Super Huge Interferometric Telescope. Presumably it was deliberate just to see if they could get away with it. And they did. It was actually, it was actually published. And after that, all that remains is to reveal the, the meaning of my own acronym, which I use in my strange title. Astronomy has indeed gone bananas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. And uh, can you please stop sharing your screen?
Thank you, Neil. Actually, there's a there's another one that that I haven't got in the talk that I've just that I just come across pretty recently, and it's even worse than Gadzooks, if that's possible. It's a, an experiment that's that's trying to detect axions, which are yet another of those hypothetical particles predicted by my theory, and it's called, if I can remember it. A broadband resonant approach to cosmic axion detection with an amplifying B field ringing apparatus, abracadabra. Right. <laughs> I, th I think capstone. Oh, what? I think capstone should be in that list. If you have a look at capstone on the NASA website, it tells you what it stands for. But it is contrived. I, I can promise you that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, have we got any questions for Neil Haggard, please? I am not seeing any questions, Neil. Uh, so that what? just leaves me to ask everybody to give you a big next for Swinton Astronomical Society. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Haggard. Thank you very much.